Uh, Amy Geraghty is a zoology curator at the National Museum of Ireland. Uh, she started her role in 2020 in the middle of the pandemic, <laughs> nightmare, um, and the start of a decant project. Wow. Uh, she enjoys a varied nature of the work and seeing people engage with the collections and in the museum. She's mainly responsible for the spirit collection of natural history. Um, Amy has been a, Natska, a member of Natska since 2020 and is always more than happy to talk about parasite worms, spirit collections and outreach. Um, I love parasites and I find them absolutely fascinating, but I want to look at them. I don't want them on me. <laughs> Uh, right, so I'll I'll let you crack on, Amy. Are you I'm okay? just doing the thing that everyone does. Uh, can everyone see my screen if I turn it into slideshow mode? Yeah. Perhaps is it in slideshow or? Oh, it's in. Uh, yes, it is now. Yeah. Uh, this is a bit more of an informal talk. I gave a lunchtime talk about learning from loans in my limited experience. So. I've been in my role for about three years and this will be the outline of the talk. My experience with loans is that which I've had in the National Museum of Ireland. It'll cover the labels, codes and packing that I've experienced and examples and learnings I've made. And then just to summarize it. And so it is quite not a limited experience, but uh, focus, shall we say, the Republic of Ireland, uh, the National Museum of Ireland. And I predominantly manage or look after the wet collection. So that's kind of my experience of loans. Where I am lacking, I asked colleagues to just chip in. So to just give people a broad overview of legislation in Ireland or wildlife, um, it'll be covered. The international and the European is definitely covered elsewhere, but I just want to draw people's attention to our National Wildlife Act. Um, it's going to be potentially another amendment made to it. So there might be consequences listed of listed protected species. Our wildlife authority is the National Parks and Wildlife Service. They issue wildlife and licenses for collecting, harvesting and holding of wild birds and animals in Ireland. And it's involved with the amendments of the National Wildlife Act and it lists the protected species there on the website. So to just get started with the loan process in the National Museum of Ireland, there's an application once it's approved and it's all signed off on. Um, we and the individual interested in undertaking the loan sign a loan agreement. I find this really helpful because it states in black and white what the expectations are and they have to, and the idea that they have to return it within a timely manner. There's also a possibility of extension, but it's just an amendment to the form. So people have signed off on the loan agreement. The first thing you need to st then start thinking about is shipping and sending the loans. First of all, keep hard copies of the agreements. They're great to refer back to. They're easy to use. Digital files can become corrupted. Record the loan in your collections software and then start preparing. And to just flag two key things um, that have come in in Ireland, air codes, it's like our PO boxes. They're now mandatory for designated couriers such as DHL. It's just an alphanumeric code and it's been there since 2015. That said, there's still a lot of people who don't know it. And then tariff codes, it's um, as a result of Brexit. And I know it was mentioned previously, people are getting a lot more diligent about these codes. So we really have to pay attention to them for the import and export. If you don't know the air code, there's an air code website, so you can look it up there. Also, just to start off on the tariff codes, the integrated tariff, co tariff codes for the European Union, it is just a numerical code. Um, it's this is the EU regulation or EEC regulation that covers it, and it must be on export and import around the EU. Now, there is a database. I have a link for it I can provide. This heading is the main one used for museum specimens. Heading 9705, collections and collectors, pieces of archaeological, ethnographic, historical, zoological, bot botanical, mineralogical, anatomical, paleontological, or numistic interest. And from there, there are subcategories. So you'll come out with a code that will start with the 9705, but it will also be informed by where it, the specimen is being shipped from, where it's being shipped to, and the actual specimen themselves. So you can get different subheadings from here. What happens if you make a mistake? This is from the website of OnPost, Ireland's postal service. It's on the importer and exporter. They state they have no responsibility for the incorrect codes and it can have serious consequences for the export, import and handling of the loan. 
these breaks are just examples of specimens. This didn't happen in transit. However, it is worth documenting your specimen before it goes out for loan and after. On my left, bottom left there, I just have an example of a letter um, that contains a specimen for a citizen science project run by the museum. And this is the state it came to me in. Luckily, the specimen and data card or information was still with the specimen doubly sealed in a plastic bag. But to say the envelope was damaged en route is an understatement. And this can be a serious undertaking. We had a huge loan and we had to take pictures of damaged specimens prior to they went out. And it's just the setup here. So you just have to really plan ahead and do due diligence when undertaking loans. So um, speaking of that harmonized code and when mistakes happen, it did happen. Um, we have this lovely new form called the health entry document or common health entry document, which is a, coming into effect after Brexit. Unfortunately, dry material was being returned. There were microscope slides of palakites and very easily the wrong numerical code was used. The heading started from um, zoological specimens and it acted accidentally got classified as a live viable material instead of, again, that subheading, so catchy, 9705, which it goes under the collector or collections um, subheading. So my, our Department of Agricultural Food and Marine um, would not release the material to the museum if we did, were not able to fill out this particular form. If we did not fill out this particular form, they were also threatening to incinerate the material. Thankfully, I was able to get in contact with someone in customs. Um, the sender was able to resubmit the correct form, but it was really helpful having contact details to hand, a conversation with the, con like the correct customs official. And again, Although I noted the error, I was in contact, the sender had to be the one to correct it. I had no power or authority to change that harmonized code. It was the person who sent it over. So it's just worth bearing in mind. And if you are interested in sending over live material or you have live collections, there is a helpful uh, YouTube video out by the Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine, the Common Health Entry Document. Uh, I have it in a link I'll be sharing after this in a Word document, but it's well worth a watch because it's well worth preserving specimens. And this is just the key findings from that. I cannot overstate enough if I will provide this in the document again, the harmonized code, which relates to museum collections. The decision is made by the receiving customs official and the sender must update. So again, it's well worth staying in contact with people. Now you can also decide to hand carry specimens in. Um, an example of this is a large loan of dry molluscan material uh, that was being sent out for research. And to give you an idea of how clearly you have to label, first of all, double seal um, the bracing material inside this really useful box or plastic box is plastizote and um, thin and thick sections. We would label several times scientific research specimens not restricted, not CITES listed, and when it was acquired by the museum, and then all the contact details, mobile phone numbers if needed as well, just to have that safe protocol. And also just to give you an idea of how useful plastizo it is, we did inserts for the smaller or micro mollusks. Again, another thing is when you're sending out a loan or packing a loan of this size, have a colleague check your work. I forgot to turn over a sheet and include a whole table of agreed upon specimens. It was easily rectified, but it's just worth noting a lot of time could have been saved. Next up is when handling specimens, take the next, take the care. Um, while photographing the broken specimens or damage before they went out due to a new energy conservation strategy of my institution, someone turned off the lights as I was packing the material. This resulted in a fragment of a type being lost on the floor and having to search and ban all cleaning from that area and crawl on my hands, my knees with torch for three days. I did find the type, but again, it took time. Thankfully, we also have loans for larger specimens. And just to give an example of this, that is fragile. It is a gill rakers of a basking shark that was used. Someone was interested in the fluid dynamics of the species. One way to get to pack this for loan was to wrap it in Tyvek. It's a good fabric. It does not catch on the small strands. 
double seal it, label it several times over with the specimen number and various fragile markings. And one handy tip I picked up from the entomologist in the National Museum of Ireland, Dr. Aidan O'Hanlon, is to include a photo several times over. Um, he relayed to me several times curious custom officers opened a box just to see it and the pins around the insect or bug were displaced and damaged it. So it's one way to counteract that. Even with all the labeling and the codes, people could just open it to see what it's looking at. So on the lid or anywhere else you can provide pictures of the specimen wrapped and unwrapped. Now, the National Museum of Ireland doesn't handle botanical specimens, so I reached out to my colleagues in the National Botanic Gardens of Ireland. Um, they have dealt with loans of herbarium sheets, um, so they use for guidelines from the Swedish Natural History Museum and the Herbarium Handbook of Kew. They label things as fragile, they're dried scientific herbarium specimens handled with care, no commercial value. And what we have here is pictures of how they prepare the specimens or the herbarium sheets. Each one is placed into individual paper cards or folders. Folders are stacked um, with corrugated cardboard sheets in between. Each stack is tied. It's then wrapped in bubble wrap, wrap and then it's sent over in another casing. Um, it is assumed that it will be frozen uh, when it's received due to a quarantining measure. So they're prepared for that as well. So this is where it gets a bit more exciting. Um, bar the actual challenges of packing and hand carrying or dealing with things on a local level, shipping internationally can be interesting with what gets classified as dangerous specimens or dangerous goods, which is simply known as a hazardous material is any substance or material capable of posing an unreasonable risk to health, safety, property when transported in commerce. For these kind of classifications, everything doubly must be clearly and correctly labeled. And this can be varied in terms of collections. For wet collections, this does include alcohols, ethanol, isopropanol, methanol, etc. Geological collections can have radioactive material. Dry zoological collections can have toxins, pathogens, and botanical collections will be covered in the preceding talk. If you are shipping dangerous goods or dangerous natural history collections, specimens by air, ship or rail, there are cla these classifications stand. They're worth familiarizing yourself depending on the transport you're using or shipping method you're using for specimens. And again, that harmonized system is the key. There is also an annex, Annex 18, I want to draw everyone's attention to. This is where we get to classify or have special provisions. This is for the dangerous goods or um, natural history specimens that fall into these categories. So Annex 18 of the safe transport of dangerous goods by air is really, really key for labels. One special provision I'm very familiar with is the one for spirit collections. It is special provision A180. It should be all over the labels and it has requirements for packing. Your fluid or spirit or alcohol specimens, the cumulative volume, even if you're sending multiple specimens, it cannot exceed 30 milliliters. The specimens should be in a rigid vial or sealed and they should be wrapped in a paper towel or cheesecloth or an absorbent material. And you have to double heat seal. In this case, I had a loan of parasitic isopods. I even had to decant the fluid here because it exceeded the 30 milliliters. I wrapped it in absorbent material. I double labeled because I didn't want association to happen either. And I double heat sealed. And that went in a small plastic box into a cardboard box and was shipped. There can be other ways to do this. Um, other people use Eppendorf tubes. They're put in a plastic bag and then they're housed with little um, inserts cut out so they can be held stiff by that plastizoid or foam. That's very useful again, but again, must be double heat sealed or double sealed in the case of the plastic bag and the Eppendorf tube and have absorbent material down at the bottom. There are exemptions to the 30 milliliter rule. I have not dealt with them in an international way, but I have dealt with them in um, on a local level. These are gills of a sunfish that were for a research loan to a local college or a nearby college. Double sealed, nonetheless, braced in this box um, with museum tape. 
and then there was absorbent material put at the bottom, uh, braced with that plastizoid in a leak-proof crate. And again, that's how they went out, sealed and came back to us. I haven't had any experience with this, but in my reading for this talk, I saw that there was a professional or special provision A130. It's for radioactive material. It again would detail how it has to be handled, labeled and packed. But again, it's in Annex 8 or 18. Now, in particular, there is a need to be extra cautious when sending to and from Australia. In my limited experience, this is some of the information you will have to include on an import export permit from the Department of Agriculture. Scientific name, method of kill, method of fixation and preservation. You have to make sure it is free from seed, soil, animal debris and other biological material and it is double sealed. And then, of course, there will be quarantine service fees if you're in if you do not do any of these. There's also a great guideline for natural history collections. It came out in November 2015. There are case studies. So again, those special subheadings, examples and provisions that you have to make. And really for Australia, it's well worth looking after. I can upload the document to the chat after this. And there is precedent set, as was mentioned in the earlier talks in 2017, herbarium or botanical specimens were incinerated by customs or Australian customs. And you can see by the quotes, it was, um, it provoked a really strong reaction. And it was after the incineration of some lichens and mosses known from New Zealand as well. Nothing of the sort has happened since, but it just emphasizes the incredible um, level of detail and importance and risk when sending specimens for research elsewhere. This is a worked example of included in the PowerPoint just for labeling, just to give you an idea, it's from that 2015 case studies um, document. And I haven't done this, but if you were sending ambergris to Australia, again, it's almost like the tariff codes where you have the subheadings, but the different numbers and subheadings depend on your specimen, where it's coming from, where it's going and the preservation methods. And this is just for ambergris. So there's the goods, non the goods code and then the description. I have had some experience with um, a loan returning from Australia. However, you can take every precaution and accidents happen. There was a systems error with the tracking code of their postal system. The loan was returned or requested back in 2022. Um, and it's just something to consider when you're loaning material out. There was a time difference and um, these were fluid specimens. They were historic um, cephalopod types. The different climate, it was our winter, their summer, and the person who handled shipping in their institution retired. So our contact details were out of date. So again, it, would, it was an extra level of delay or confusion what was happening. Also, just to make it interesting, um, the National Museum of Ireland has a site on the West Coast as well, the Museum of Country Living. So it was also interesting to check if it could have been delivered to any of these other sites because the Australian postal system, our postal system on post didn't have a record of it. And I just contacted colleagues throughout the National Museum of Ireland. It's very easy for, say, for example, a piece of post or package to get put in someone's cubby hole as opposed to mine or the National Museum of Ar or Natural Histories. Also down there handily, I have a number for Irish customs. It is a 24 hour, seven days a week um, phone line you can call. I got to know them quite well. Um, anyway, eventually, thankfully, five months later, um, with no update on the tracking system on either end for our postal combined postal services, the specimens were returned. Um, again, it was the case of an easy inversion of numbers in a code. And then from there, it just goes to show if you pack correctly and take precaution, the specimens, despite being in transit for five months in different weather conditions, that 30 milliliters and double heat seal in muslin and absorbent material works. There was no damage to the morphology of the cephalopod types at all, which was really good. So after that, um, once you've gotten your loan back, don't forget to return it to the location, update your paperwork, print out your paperwork and update your software. And this is just a reminder to myself and others, it's great to 
and to justify the hassle of loans, great work can be done. This is the large Molluscan loan I was involved with, and it is now all our types are digitized up on the Molluscan types of Britain and Ireland website. And it has been a great bit of research and work that you can see coming out from it. And just to summarize, loan agreements are useful. Label multiple times, clearly and often. Do your due diligence. There can be updates to legislation, changes due to politics or people just becoming more aware. Keep contact details to hand. Uh, people are incredibly helpful. It can be quicker to contact them on the phone or, or over email. And then mistakes do happen. Plan ahead and adapt. Thanks very much for your time. Uh, no, am I? Is my, oh. You're, yeah. Yeah, sorry, clicking things twice. Um, uh, wow, um, a huge topic and uh, a whistle stop tour and <laughs> um, <laughs> and I am just flabbergasted that that specimen was okay after. It just goes to show with the right packing and like that's it, we couldn't have, I wasn't involved with packing for that loan and I will say how you pack it and send it over to the institution, they tend to mirror. So if you do take the time and the process, it's a kind of like a guideline for the institution returning it to copy and then it works and it great work happens after loans as well so there's a reason why I spent three days on my hands and my knees for that specimen and um are there any other questions has um does anybody want to put something in the chat and also a reminder um the hands up um button is under reactions if anybody wants to do that um are there any instances where you've refused a loan? What are the, yeah. To my knowledge, um, it came down to risk to the specimen and because they were close enough, a Ryanair flight was cheaper. Um, or in the case, it was that they were just a college up the road. Um, so rather than pack it, we just invited them in, which they weren't aware they were able to do. So they could be practicing in-house and then they got to look at a few other specimens while they were on site. I've just thrown in the links as well from my talk. So it's effectively to any other thing I mentioned in there. Yeah, that's super useful. Thank you. Yeah, because, um, yeah, especially when you're posting internationally, uh, you know, a lot of those links will be um, very re relevant because um, I'm not aware. Um, I, I don't know who's going to be. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming that this talk is mostly sort of UK centric, but um, yes especially well there's you there's me you know there's a bunch of us that aren't so uh, it is useful to have that to hand uh, I've got a uh, a question from Benja um hi Amy great talk uh, a question about wet specimens in large jars have you ever had experience in moving them from site to site uh, I think you have um and how would this be achieved i.e plastazote or other forms of stabilization I um have seen some fabulous pictures that you guys did. Yeah. So yeah, you could tell us a bit. It about absolutely it. can be done. Um, again, depending on how large it is, um, we have some specimens that are going to be delivered actually next Tuesday that are taller than myself. <laughs> um, that's a tall jar. And not that I'm particularly tall, but tall for me. That bracing inside the crate, so the leak-proof black crate, absorbent material down the bottom, and then that collapsible crate we reinforced with cable ties and use museum type to tie around it. One thing that I will say is not intuitive is when using museum type uh, tape to tie off the specimens, don't strap it down as if it's going into stormy weather. It can be too rigid. What you want to do is just prevent it knocking into other specimens. So not too tight. Exactly. You're just dampening down um, vibrations and the fluid buffers as well. So there's a talk, um, I think Paolo did, and it's all on the museum website. I see if I can reach it out. And there's one I did specifically for moving fluid specimens during the decant. I think it was tales of the decant getting into the spirit of things. I have a sickness for puns and um, I can share in there too. But again, as long as you have the absorbent material and stuff to dampen down the vibrations or the potential movement of specimens, Oh, I can see Ellie has a question. So if you're sending a wet specimen that will not fit into a container of 30 milliliters or less, does that mean it can't be set in air at all? No, not at all. It must be wrapped and heat sealed. So like those um, cephalopod types, effectively what they were were wrapped in 
alcohol soaked muslin and then double heat sealed. So they were sent as that and they were soft and then they were put into a box which gave it the structure and protection. Oh. That's good to know, actually. Uh, just Donnie Nicholson said, um, if you are shipping dangerous goods, there is a requirement to take training by an accredited trainer. It's three days plus an exam. Oh, Laura, sorry, you're muted. Hey, oh, not keeping track. Oh, yeah. So, um, uh, Maggie says, um, do you, could you put packing specification into your loan agreements with other institutions, i.e., um, as you mentioned, they should pack it to return how it arrived? Um, I know you yeah. said yeah, um, people often follow your lead, but that actually it would be good to also have it in writing. That's a really good point. Yeah, it could be done um, because we've had to specify before when someone was sending it back without a designated courier that that was a requirement of the loan. So they ended up, but it, it took getting to that and sending them back the agreement they and their institution had signed on to use the designated courier. Yeah. Um, and you read out um, Donnie's um, mm -hmm. yeah, good point. comment. Um. Wow, that was, um, well, yeah, fantastic stuff. Um, any other questions? Uh, we've got a little bit of time if anybody has anything. Um, have you, um, when you've ever received, do you guys um, receive loans in? Have you ever like requested loans for, you know, exhibitions and things like that? We have, but not in my experience. We had a an exhibition for a geological um subject down to earth, which has now come out, but that was done co-curated with the Geological Survey of Ireland. So the material was how it was exchanged institution to institution. So there was a memorandum of understanding between them. But that's the extent of my knowledge on it. My apologies. Yeah, that's fine. Um, Helen James says, a uh, question to Donny, um, I want to send specimens to London um, for UK BOL, um, are they in ethanol, uh, they are in ethanol, so do I need to send this, uh, do, do I need to do this training before I can send these? Oh hi, can you hear me? <laughs> um, well yeah, officially we've always been told as part, uh, part of um if you're going to ship, even in the, like Amy was saying, the, uh, using the special provision A180, the, you know, the ones that are in limited amount of ethanol. Um, yeah, and that's sort of a get around, not a get around of dangerous goods, but it's a, well, it is in a way, but yeah, but you're supposed to really be having a undertaking training courses to, to ship anything that's deemed dangerous goods um and yeah we do we do we have to do it I and mean, we've got one coming up in january and we we always go oh my god not another one and it's like it's a three if you haven't done one before it's, it's three days plus example um and it's two it's two days to do the uh to retake it uh, once you've done it but yeah so every year you have to we have to we have to go through the whole process um Ooh. and are um, you licensed afterwards or do you have to hold yeah you get a certificate and you you know you're um so whoever you ship with um so we use dhl as courier and they'll ask us for you know proof of our certification mm -hmm. so if we, if we got if our account because our account is certified to um to ship dangerous goods um and i think all the things you know dry ice and whatever so but yeah they will need to send them our certificate so we you know as a shipper um yeah we're all legit as it were but yeah, right. Re yeah, yeah, I recommend you wear. I will do. Uh, we use DHL as well as our designated courier, and to my okay. knowledge, yeah, uh, we haven't. But that might be. Yeah, I mean, to, I don't. You know, it's like I don't know whether how what, you know we because we we've just always been told we have to do it. But I mean, we get stuff from all over the place, and and we and it's it's obvious that they haven't done any training because and we'll say, well, do you realise you do have to, you know, ship it this way? Like, do you use an ESPA one eight? Like, oh no, no idea. Um, so it's a bit of a, you know, okay, so we have to tell, you know, to tell them like, like you, you know, you, you showed how to do it, you know, and send the regulations or whatever, and then they ship it back. But, uh, but yeah, I think, I think legally you're supposed to have to, you know, 
go through the training. But it'd be interesting to know how many that's, people actually that's do fair point as well. Yeah. Could you share yeah. the link with us, Donny, if you have um, yeah. information about how to do it? Thank you. Yeah, sure. I mean, this you can. I think you can. Yeah, if you go to IR to the IR to website, the the uh, they should have links to accredited trainers. We've got I mean, we've got one we use um, regularly, so I can send his details on. Yeah, because if it's um, like, I think his name is company, like but uh, prohibitive because yeah. I mean, you know how expensive it is, and and especially if you have to do it every year, and you know, obviously for for like large institutions such as yourself, um, that's you know kind of part and parcel of what you do. Yeah. But particularly if you're a small institution and it's like an unusual request, perhaps. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it might be off. That's like quite a a, a financial. And yeah, I know definitely. Yeah, I can't. I don't know the exact cost. Um. But yeah, if you've got a few people in your institution that are going to be doing it, then it'd be good just to get them all done in one go, I guess, and you know, get one job lot done. But uh, but yeah, I can I can forward your details and stuff, Amy, if you want. You do, whoever. And yeah, yeah, I I think it's just a general point to be made, and it was made earlier. Um, just because they're done like this now doesn't mean they can be in the future. People are becoming way more diligent. We've gotten a few bounce backs, and I've been in contact with customs more often than not when previously. Yeah. There was no issue and it was literally a loan return. So it gone out and everything else was fine. But because we we issued extensions or asked people to hold on to the specimens until after the dust had settled from Brexit. Yeah. And there seems to be a noticeable um shall we say upgrade yeah. on the attention paid yeah. to it. Yeah, no. But I mean we I mean it's it is important because we have we've received stuff back or in um that have just like like say fish in ethanol that have just been in like yes. used water bottles and have just been leaking through the packages and I, 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 <laughs> no idea how they managed to get through customs. I mean, you you could probably, you could just see it, you know, you could smell it, and um, mm. so there was no um, obviously they didn't know how to pack it correctly, but uh, but yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's worth uh, doing. And also, do, if you do the course, I mean, it just opens up a you know you 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 then legally able to you know ship chemicals if you need to other other stuff um and uh yeah so it's it's, it's useful it's a bit of a yeah you sort of a uh, bit of a challenge to doing it especially if you get the, the, the three hour exam but um it's open book mind but it still doesn't make it any less <laughs> no i particularly uh, find the codes uh the harmonized codes because they're not alphanumeric they're just all numeric I have other people check them and I check them for other yeah. people because it's just too easy. In, in one case, we had someone invert the last two numbers and that was it. And it, it was very easily done, but... Yeah, yeah. I, 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 no, 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 I'm with you. I'm just like, because we, 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 we'll use the 9705 thing pretty much for everything. And we use it so much that we sort of go, actually, what, what are we shipping? We have to just reach, <laughs> recheck it. And we send all this stuff like field work equipment and God knows what else. And then we have to itemize everything and it can be a bit of a, a, bit of a chore. So, um, but yeah. And the website isn't great when you look trying to look through the codes. Not everything's there, I find. But anyway, that's uh that's No, but there start. is a book. I think it's like thirty-five pounds or dollars. I've just sent the link there into the chat, but um I, I've put in to get it for our library because when you go looking online, there you get mixed yeah. results and obviously people are doing what they think it is rather than you don't have the source material or trained yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. But um and just to say that if you to, yeah, if you need the well, if after you do the training for dangerous goods, you'll you'll probably need the 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 uh, the book as well, dangerous goods book, and that's about it's, unfortunately it's about I think it's nearly three hundred quid. I think. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, it's wow. a bit of bad news. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's um something that um I've I've sort of experienced working in smaller institutions is that often. Um, when you start coming across various legislation or licenses yeah. or you know practices, uh, that that often is like a, quite a, a large price tag yeah, attached yeah. to you know, getting um, drugs licenses and stuff like that. But you know if you literally got a handful of specimens, or um, you know you're shipping one thing and you don't regularly do this, um, you know sometimes you're thinking you're you're lumped with a bill for you know a few thousand pounds and you're like we can't afford this like no no it's crazy no. Uh, just to clarify i think vicky in the chat i just said that it's a, it's every two years so i didn't i don't know whether i said it was yearly but no so sorry it's, it's every two years the, the training 
Right. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Oh, and it was based at Heathrow. Uh, so that's. Yeah. Oh, well, like, yeah, we, we, we've done it Heathrow. We've done it. We've got somebody coming in. We tend to have someone coming on site and we've done it on over, over um, online as well during the pandemic. So you can, you know, over Zoom or whatever. So, but yeah. Definitely handy if, if, if they can do it online. Too. Mm. So you're not yeah. in your own country or, or into different countries. Um, mm. Okay. Well, we're slightly ahead of schedule. Um, 